New Life East, peace be with you this morning. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. This is a funny morning. I'm recording this on Monday morning after Easter Sunday, and I've been telling some folks uh, what a strange moment this is for us. You know, like we uh, we celebrated Easter Sunday yesterday. I woke up early and I made uh, made waffles for my family, and we had a little time of reading scripture together and. Then we watched the services yesterday morning and just had a great time with that. And then, you know, a few hours later, we were done. And I ate a little bit of lunch. And then there was nothing on TV, so I watched an old football game yesterday afternoon and fell asleep at 3 in the afternoon watching football. When I woke up, snow was falling. It felt like, and there was a ham cooking in the oven. It felt like Thanksgiving. And then we woke up this morning, and it feels like there's snow on the ground everywhere. It feels like Christmas morning. So this is just like this most bizarre moment. But I did think yesterday morning while we were... Uh, while my family and I were gathered around the table and while we were worshiping together, I thought, you know, what we get to do here and what we are doing is something maybe that only Christians can do. That in the middle of all of this, what feels like darkness and catastrophe and portent and omen flashing in the sky, Christians are waking up and they're saying, even from their homes, like when we can't even gather in church buildings, Christians are waking up on Easter Sunday and they're saying, Christ the Lord is risen today, hallelujah. And so Easter is that moment when we remember that God has not just entered into our darkness, but he's actually triumphed over the darkness. And so we say in the creed that we're looking for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. We're looking for him to return again in glory to judge the living and the dead, that the resurrected one is coming again and he'll complete his victory, which means that sin and death and the grave and hell and calamity and catastrophe, even though in one sense it's all around us, in a more important sense it's fundamentally behind us because of what Jesus has done for us. And so in these next weeks together, in our little midweek devotional here, I wanna take you into some texts that center us in the reality of resurrection and help us recover our identity in this season as a resurrection people. So if you have Bibles, I'm gonna invite you to turn to John chapter 20. John chapter 20. Of course, John was one of Jesus' best friends. And so John's portrayal of Jesus, in fact, we think that John was the one, uh, he was the beloved disciple. So he was the one who was leaning back against Jesus' chest. John had this incredibly intimate um, and proximate relationship to Jesus that was unusual even among the disciples. And so the portrait that Jesus or that John gives us of Jesus is always fantastically intimate. And I just love the picture that we have here. So I'm gonna be in John chapter 20, and uh, I'm gonna start in verse 19. But let's pause our hearts for a word of prayer here. Lord Jesus Christ, only Son of the Father, incarnate one, crucified, died, and raised to life again. We center our hearts on you and we center our minds on you. We center our affections on you today. We thank you that you are the one who was raised to life again by the power of God. And we thank you that you are the one who will return again in glory to judge the living and the dead and your kingdom will have no end. And we thank you that you're also the present one in your resurrection power. You're with us, your life is around us. And so we pray that wherever we find ourselves as we watch this video, we pray that the resurrection life of God would come to us and touch us and wake us up and encourage us. Give us hope today, we pray. Give us hope today, we pray. We pray that you'd open the scriptures to us, Lord Jesus, that you would speak to us and encourage us and help us. Grant that we're asking in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and all God's people said, amen. Verse 19. On evening of that first day of the week, so this is a resurrection text, that first day of the week. This is right after Jesus is raised from the dead. On evening of that first day of the week, this is the first Easter Sunday is what this is, when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. And after he said this, he showed them his hands and his sides and the disciples, or his side, and the disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. And again, Jesus said, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so am I sending you. And with that, he breathed on them. 
that breath of God, that wind of God that brooded over the waters of primeval chaos, here Jesus breathes that same breath over the disciples. He breathed on them and he said, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, they are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. And now Thomas, also known as Didymus, one of the 12, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and unless I put my finger where the nails were, put my hand into his side, I will not believe. So one week later then, his disciples were in the house again and Thomas this time was with them. And though the doors were locked, when Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. It's the third time now that he said this, peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here, he says, see my hands reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. And at that moment, Thomas says to him, my Lord and my God. And then Jesus told him, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen me and yet have believed, brothers and sisters. This is the word of the Lord. And we all together said, thanks be to God. On evening of that first day of the week, When the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you guys. This is fantastic stuff. The first Easter Sunday begins with an empty tomb and rumors of the resurrection. And it ends with the disciples huddled together in an upper room with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders. Like they came for John the Baptist and they got him. Then they came for Jesus and they got Jesus. Then it seems like somebody robbed the grave. This is terrible. And now they're coming for us too. They're scared for their lives and they're totally socially distanced from the Jewish leaders with the doors locked. They're huddled in fear, afraid of all of the terrors on the outside. Guys, who says the Bible isn't relevant? I mean, this is the first Easter Sunday and here we are 2,000 years later. And for all of the great things that have happened in Christian history, we still find ourselves in that moment. The doors are locked for fear of the Jewish leaders. When Jesus came and he stood among them and he said, peace be with you. And I just love how intimate the portrayal is of Jesus, that Jesus finds his way inside that place of fear and that place of frustration and that place of terror. And he speaks the word of God's peace. And when John says that this is the first day of the week, we really actually ought to hearken back to, uh, to the text of Genesis. Genesis, ta- Genesis talks about that first, that first creation week, the creation was made in six days and on the seventh day God rested. When it says the first day of the week, what we're seeing here is that this is really the first day of the new creation. And whenever the New Testament talks about the resurrection of Jesus from the dead, it almost always talks about it in these cosmic terms, that Jesus is not just, this isn't the resuscitation of a dead person and then life goes on like normal, but the resurrection of Jesus from the dead inaugurates a sort of new history. There's a new moment in cosmic history is upon us. Paul draws attention to it in classic resurrection text, 1 Corinthians 15. Paul writes that Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead comes also through a man. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ will all be made alive, but each in his own turn. Christ, the first fruits, then when he comes, those who belong to him, and then the end will come when he hands over the kingdom to God the Father after he has destroyed all dominion, authority, and power. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. And the last enemy to be destroyed is death, for he has put everything under his feet. Now when it says that everything has been put under him, it's clear that this does include God himself, who has put everything under Christ. But when he's done this, then the Son himself will be made subject to him who put everything under him, so that God may be all in all. The beginning of the new world is at hand here. The resurrection of the dead is upon us. The picture that Paul paints is that Christ is the first fruits and Christ now from heaven is reigning until he puts all his enemies under his feet and one day the kingdom will be completed, it will be perfected. And so when we look at this text and we ask the question about, so the new creation is like dawning upon us. So Jesus, what are you gonna do about it? What's the first thing that you do? Are you gonna go to Rome and throw Caesar off the throne? Are you gonna run over into Pilate's, the governor's palace and throw Pilate off the throne? Are you gonna end all oppression and war and plague and famine? What are you gonna do, Jesus? What's the first action of the resurrected Christ? Well, we find that the first action of the resurrected Christ is that he finds his disciples in their fears and he speaks a word of God's peace to them. 
he speaks a word of God's peace to them. Turns out that God has been doing this with people for a very long time. When I think about this story this week as I was preparing this message for you, uh, my imagination, I found it drawn back to the great story of Hagar. In the book of Genesis chapter 16, you might remember the story. Abraham and Sarah have been promised that there would be an heir who would carry the promises for them, but they, both of them, uh, Abraham can't have kids and uh, Sarah is barren. And so Sarah, one day she gives her servant Hagar to Abram. She says, sleep with, sleep with Hagar. Why don't you build a promised family through her? And so he does, and she gives birth to this child. And Sarah all of a sudden starts mistreating Hagar. And Hagar goes, I can't do this. She's afraid. And Hagar flees into the wilderness. And the scripture says that the angel of the Lord finds her in the wilderness and says, Sarah, where have you come from and where are you going? Don't worry about your family. Don't worry about your child. God sees you. God hears you. God knows about you. And Hagar winds up naming that place Be'er Lahai Ro'i well of the living one who sees me. For she says, I have now seen the one who sees me. Brothers and sisters, this is our God. He's the God who characteristically hears us when we're in trouble and we're calling out to him. In fact, in fact, uh, Hagar names her child Ishmael. Ishmael means God hears. God is the one who hears us and God is the one who sees us. And God is the one who finds us all throughout the scriptural text. God reveals himself as this particular God, the God who hears, the God who sees, the God who finds us in our place of fear. And in Jesus Christ, we're seeing that person in the flesh. And I'm just here to say to you that this is who Jesus Christ is for us. It's easy for us in this moment of quarantine and isolation to feel like the resurrected Christ surely must have more important things to deal with. And I'm telling you, he doesn't have more important things to deal with than this, but he's got all the time in the world. And I don't know where you find yourself as you're watching this. Maybe you find yourself without a job, or maybe you find yourself the cupboards are running bare, or maybe you find yourself in a place of great frustration. Your family is, you guys have been so, it's like becoming a pressure cooker in your house. You're like, what is going on here? And I'm telling you that Jesus Christ is for you and he's with you in the midst of all of that. Uh, I think about my own kids, you know. Uh, we have four kids, Ethan, Gabe, Bella, and Liam. And uh, especially when they were really little, and this still happens every once in a while, you know, they'll come to us in the middle of the night uh, terrified from a dream that they have. And their bodies, their little bodies will be trembling with fear. And you know, you're at three o'clock in the morning and you're just trying to kind of find your, you're in your sleep zone. And all of a sudden you've got the eight year old that's sort of in front of you, breathing heavily upon you with their middle of the night breath, trying to explain to you this dream and crying and freaked out. And the thing that we'll always do with the kids when they show up at the bedside like that, is that we'll grab the kids and we'll pull them close and I'll draw them under the covers and I will wrap my arms around them until I feel in their bodies that they've calmed down, that they're settled. And sometimes that'll take one minute, and sometimes it'll take two, sometimes five, sometimes 10, but I'll do that as long as it takes until the peace of God that is in me passes bodily into them. And then they can talk me through what they've experienced and I'll go put them back to bed. Brothers and sisters, this is who God is for us. This is who the resurrected Christ is for us. He is the God who comes to us with strong arms in our fear and our terror. And he wraps those strong arms around us and he imparts his peace to our troubled bodies and our troubled minds. One of the great hymns of the old church says, what a fellowship, what a joy divine, leaning on the everlasting arms. What a blessedness, what a peace is mine, leaning on the everlasting arms. Leaning, leaning, safe and secure from all alarms. Leaning, leaning, I'm leaning on the everlasting arms. What have I to dread, what have I to fear, leaning on the everlasting arms. I have blessed peace with my Lord so near. Leaning on the everlasting arms. Leaning, leaning, safe and secure from all alarms. Leaning, leaning leaning on the everlasting arms. You can lean on the everlasting arms. You can lean into the everlasting arms for Jesus is with you and he has penetrated the darkness of your fear where you've got the doors locked and you're trying to keep the terror out. You cannot keep Jesus Christ out. He is with you and he is near you. So trust in him and believe in him. The first thing that Jesus does is he finds his disciples in their fears and he speaks a word of God's peace 
to them, what is the second thing that Jesus does? The new creation is breaking in upon us. What is the second thing that the resurrected Christ does? Well, he offers his disciples his body. He offers his disciples his body as a comfort for all of their doubts. Look at this in verse 20. Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side and the disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. He gives his body. Verse 24, Thomas, one of the 12, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. The other disciples said, we've seen the Lord. And he says, unless I see the nail marks and I put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. Then Jesus came and stood among them and says again, peace be with you. Then he says to Thomas, put your finger here. See my hands, reach out your hand, put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe what I love about this is that the resurrected Christ does not give them answers to their questions. He doesn't give answers to their questions. Well, Jesus, what's gonna to happen to us? The Jewish leaders have it out for us and what's gonna become of our lives? So many of us said we've, we've left our, our, our wives, our husbands, our families, and what's the future gonna hold for us? And can you give us the plan and help us allay all of our fears and answer all of our questions and, and, and speak something coherent and rational to all of our doubts and all of our thoughts? And Jesus doesn't do that. Instead, what, is he, what he gives them is his own body. He gives them his presence. And God has always been this God too. He's always been the God who transcends our questions and transcends our doubts by speaking his body, by giving his body, by offering his presence to us right in the middle of those doubts. I think of the great book of Job in the Old Testament. You remember the story of Job. Job was the most righteous man of his day, the most righteous person really that had ever lived. And one day the enemy, the tempter, the adversary came to God and said, hey, I think that the only reason that Job actually serves you is because you're nice to him, God. Why don't you remove your hand and let me have my way with him and I'll see if he won't curse you to your face. And there is this cosmic wager taking place and the Lord removes his hand of protection from Job just for a moment and the enemy swoops in and starts wreaking havoc on Job's life. And Job from that place of pain begins to offer up his doubts and his questions and his concerns and his fears. And then towards the end of the book of Job, God begins to rush at Job with his presence, with his presence. And by the end of the book of Job, Job says, I had heard about you with my ears, but now I have seen you with my eyes. Do you know what Job longed for more than answers to his questions? He longed for an experience of the presence of God. And brothers and sisters, I know that many of you are sitting inside your homes today and you're thinking about your doubts and your questions and your fears and what does the future hold and am I gonna have a job and are my kids gonna be okay? Is my mom and dad gonna be okay? Am I gonna have enough to eat? And Jesus Christ is not going to unroll all of the, he doesn't have the scroll that he's gonna unroll that will give you the answers to all of your questions. Instead, what he will do and what he is doing and what he has done and what he forever will do is he will offer you his body. He'll offer you his presence and you gotta find a way to cling to that. Me these days, I showed this at our Wednesday service last week, but I have this, this old wooden cross. This is made of olive wood from a tree in Israel. A friend gave it to me many years ago. And these days I've been holding on to this as a token, as a symbol, as a sign of God's presence that Jesus is with me. And I don't know what the future holds any more than you do, but I know that my future is a future where God is with me because Christ Jesus has come to dwell among us. You gotta find a way into those places where you're reminded of the presence of Christ Jesus with you. It might be that during this season, what you decide to do is you, start, you decide to start reading the scriptures more, praying more, pausing for prayer more, whatever it takes, brothers and sisters, center yourselves in the presence of God. And so he offers himself to us, but he doesn't just offer himself to us. I wanna leave you with this one last thought. But Christ Jesus is also offering his body to the world. And right now the world that we live in is full of many doubts and many questions about what the future holds. And do you know how Jesus Christ is speaking to those doubts and questions, brothers and sisters? He's offering us to the world. I reported last week, we, New Life has been doing so much across our city to try to help people. We've given away through the ministry of New Life Church, we've given away over two tons of food to people in this community. You ask the question, how is the resurrected Christ making himself manifest to the world? Guys, he's doing it through you. 
And during this season, there's maybe outside of us just centering ourselves in God's presence, there's nothing more important for us to do than to continue to give ourselves to the world. So as you have the means and the ability, give and give and give. Offer yourselves to the world, offer yourselves to your neighbors, offer yourselves to those who are in need. Don't just stay huddled in your little room, but somehow find a way to transcend that room with the life-giving presence of Jesus and watch him bless the world. And so I pray for you today. I pray that wherever you find yourself, I pray that the presence of the resurrected Christ would encourage you and lift your heart and give you hope and make you an offering and a blessing for the world. New Life East, may the Lord today bless you and keep you. May he cause his face to shine on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, grace, mercy, and peace be with you.